And um, like I said, we've been, I've been training for, uh, for quite a while, and I've been lucky to travel the world and talk about vision. And one of the guys I've, I got to run across was uh, Jeff Grishel, our guest today. And uh, Jeff's from, uh, from Canada, and uh, we, I'm, I'm not sure exactly all the times we've met, but we've crossed paths, and um, we have a lot of people that we know together. And um, so Jeff comes from the performance world. He's got a book out, and I'm sorry, Jeff, I forgot the name of the book. I think performance, um, the performance the plan. The performance plan. There we go, yeah. the performance plan. And, and on top of it, he's got this new cool baseball uh, fuel drink called, um, I got to remember all these names. I got, got That's flustered gay. my microphone. K K KP Sport. Yeah, KP yeah. Sport. So Jeff, uh, give a little background of you and, and um, let everyone know a little bit about your background and where uh, you come from. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on first, guys. These uh, conversations have been really, really valuable. If there's one thing that's happening over this shutdown, it's just this incredible sharing of knowledge, questions, and, and uh, people getting together. And these video conferences have been great. So everybody, really quickly, my background, um, uh, I went to the University of Calgary in kinesiology. And when I went into university, you know, I was just looking to be involved in sport. Um, wound up working in the uh, Olympic Training Center at the University of Calgary, and I quickly got drawn into the world of athlete and human performance. And, and it was a really, really great place for a kid who loved sport. And I played virtually every sport under the sun uh, to get involved. Um, after university, I came back and I worked in uh, the, the professional sporting world, testing with NHL teams, worked at the universities, and wound up uh, really hanging my hat in baseball. Uh, I was lucky enough to be hired as the first full-time major league or minor league strength coach for the Toronto Blue Jays in the mid nineties. At that time, I was only the third full-time minor league co coach in the entire league. Uh, so it was a real transition time for the sport. Um, eventually worked my way up and spent uh, time in the big leagues with Toronto and uh, um, stayed there for a number of years. I still am close with the organization, still help them out with their, with their caravans and, and conferences. Uh, but I transitioned out because of family reasons and, and stayed close to the organizations and started consulting with Major League Baseball globally, which was another huge treat for me, traveling the world and looking at all the different approaches uh, for athlete development and sport performance. Um, and that sort of takes us to here today. My background now is sort of sports science as a whole, looking at how to develop athletes so we can develop uh, uh, and really, really hone uh, in-game performance skills and of course coming across uh, Ryan and, and all the guys on the visual side of it it was a really really eye-opener for me no pun uh, <laughs> but that sort of led us here today and it's been a it's been a great ride and and I find you know with with every turn of the page we're learning something new so I'm really looking forward to the discussion today you know I have I, Ryan I've been actually doing a podcast now and a radio show here on the the, the TSN Sports Network radio network and podcast. It's been up for 16 years. And the reason we started that is much like the reason you guys started this, just to share information, you know, working with the Blue Jays and in professional football and the Olympic sports, I got connected with a, a bunch of really, really good people in all different facets of sport. And it turned out to be this great sharing. But the one thing that, that happened that I didn't expect was the listeners coming back at me and our audience and our guests with, uh, with their perceptions and their ideas. Um, cause we sort of coined it as, Hey, our job is to get you thinking about things you might not think about. And what turned out, what happened was this beautiful reciprocation as where we're maybe hopefully getting people, our audience thinking about things, but they were in turn getting us thinking about things in maybe we weren't thinking about it either, either. So, so it's turned out to be a real great sharing. And that's why I'm really excited about today. Yeah. Awesome. You know, I think, uh, you know, we've shared a lot of ideas. We try, we probably don't never have enough time as we know to, uh, to have our discussions when we, when we see each other at the different events we're at. But um, you know, one of the things that, and I know you're a huge believer in this and performance is nutrition, sleep, and then obviously vision as being, you know, three of kind of, uh, uh, of many things to take athletes to another level. And, as, as we've talked, vision can be affected by nutrition and fatigue as well. And, um, you know, maybe, you know, 
give some insight from your side of, of how the three interact and as far as an athlete's concerned and the opportunities that these, these players, these coaches that are listening right now can take their athletes to another level. Yeah, guys, great. No, no, and that's so important. You know, um, guys, if anybody has questions, please throw them into the chat room. We'll get to them for sure. But it's very cool to see some of these coaches. I know some of the coaches who are on here at, at the higher levels and also to see Mitchell on who's, you know, nine years old. Uh, what a great spectrum of audience. And, and this is really important. Um, when, when we started honing in, Ryan, our approach to, you know, athlete performance and ultimate, ultimately uh, performance outcomes in sport, we sort of reverse engineered our athletes. And, and what we tried to do is come, come up with a, a tangible plan that could really make sense to the athletes, to the people working with the athletes, but also to have an effect and impact over the long term because it's a long game. So what we have in our programs is we have priorities for performance. And in, in every one of our programs, we have four priorities that are absolutely essential above and beyond anything else. And over the last 10 years, nobody has been able to convince me to change the priority or the order of these, of these four foundational building blocks. So for everybody out there, you might want to write this down, or if you have questions, you can write, write to me later on this. I can send you tons of information. But first and foremost, every single program, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about nine-year-old Mitchell or we're talking about our 10-year veterans in the big leagues, every single program has to be built around levels of recovery and monitoring levels of recovery is the most critical element in all of sport. Unfortunately, it is maybe one of the most and least um, 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 uh, attended to. And so when we look at all of our programs and the competitive schedules, if we're in the off season, the training that needs to happen, the practice times and everything else that's going on in an athlete's life, it might be school, it might be a part-time job. It might be travel with our pro guys. It might be public appearances, whatever it might be. We look at the entire life of our athletes, no matter what age they're at, and then we pack it into a daily schedule that makes sense. And around that daily schedule, the number one priority is how much quality rest do they get? So priority number one is rest and recovery. And inside of that, ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing more powerful on earth for human health and performance than sleep. Sleep is by far our number one priority. So in our hierarchy, the first thing we program into all of our programs for our athletes is sleep and then rest and recovery. And rest and recovery strategies we can talk about because that's a really interesting topic. Number two is nutrition and hydration. Because if there's anything that's going to impact how you operate on a daily basis, it's going to be what you eat and what you drink. Now, here's the thing, you know, we, we, we kind of joke around when we say this, you know, mom was right, you are what you eat, you know, <laughs> you get caught eating all the garbage all the time as a kid, you know, your mother would say, at least my mom did, anyway, you are what you eat. She kind of had it right. She didn't realize how close she was. Um, it's not so much what we eat, it's what we metabolize. And, and that's sort of the new age side of nutrition right now and some of the things that are breaking. Um, it's not what we eat eat necessarily it's what our bodies metabolize after we eat them and so a, a little shot across the bow when it comes to nutrition a calorie is not a calorie okay and that's a deep and dangerous conversation well interesting is all get up to tell you the truth but but that's really really important and so priority number one sleep rest and recovery priority number two nutrition and hydration priority number three and this is something i learned uh working with big league players uh, baseball, of course, has probably the most grueling schedule in all of sport. And when we get into that, when we get into the end season, even though we do try to push performance, we try to attack, we're in attack mode all the time, we had to be very, very strategic at what, at what we were addressing um, because of the recovery factor. But we quickly learned that if posture and range of motion around a joint weren't, weren't optimum, then the athlete's performance suffered, but they were also at a substantially higher risk for injury. So the third priority in our hierarchy is posture and range of motion, making sure the athlete can function properly. And then guys, the fourth one, and the one that I have the most fun with is teaching athletes to move. So teaching athletes to move. And, and when we talk about, and this is a question maybe I'll put out to our, to our audience right now, maybe you guys can put in the chat uh, your answer to this, but, but where do you think movement happens? Okay, we'll talk about this later. 
But, but here's my question to our audience today. And I'd like everybody just to sort of just share your thoughts. There's no wrong answer here, by the way. But if I were to ask you, where do you think movement happens? What would you say? Okay, so rest recovery, sleep is king. Above sleep, number one. Number two, nutrition, hydration, which we can run deep on. Number three, posture, range of motion. Our posture and range of motion around our joints have to be accomplished. Number four, movement. Now listen, guys. Once those four are set up and in place, now we can attack those performance parameters. And I can tell you right now, Ryan, this is why I love what you and Warren do so much. There is nothing more powerful. If we're the low, once we have an athlete, once we have an athlete healthy and functioning properly, the lowest hanging fruit on the performance tree is visual performance, but only if you know what you're doing. Only if you know what you're doing. Yeah. Well, you know, you talk about all those four, four spots and, and, you know, vision, you know, the movement, you know, obviously you want to make these guys make better movers, but you're not going to move to something without being able to accurately see something to move to. And at the same time, if you have lack of sleep, those eyes and, and the firing do not happen. If you don't have the nutrition to get those, all those things work, there, there's so much, you know, connection and all this, that uh, is a great opportunity for athletes to get better, whether it's uh, out of season right now, you know, when we're, we're locked up or whether it's in season, is getting themselves to be a lot better visually. And then, you know, with all these other four cores you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's a long game, everybody. So, you know, one of, the, one of the interesting things is, and I, you know, I'm not sure what everybody coaches here, and some great, great answers on where movement happens. These are really, really good answers, Okay. And, and I like how everybody's thinking, you know, this is really coming around. We wouldn't have seen some of these answers even two or three years ago, even from some of the top sport performance people. So you guys, really, really good. We'll, we'll talk about that more. But, but the one thing we have to really uh, pay attention to when we get into these conversations with, with such a, a diverse and great, powerful audience like this of coaches and athletes is the true understanding that it's a long game. You know, and, and I just want to share with you guys, I had a powerful call just the whole COVID shutdown. I had an incredibly powerful conversation. I, uh, I, I got called down to one of the performance um, uh, facilities in my hometown here in Edmonton. And, and um, there, there's a tennis family that just wanted to, to come out and talk shop. So I know the tennis coaches down there. I'd done a bunch of work there years and years ago. So they just asked if I was available, guys, and if I'd come down and just talk with this family. They have a very elite young female tennis player who is on track, you know, for the national program and, and for uh, some international, you know, the, the pro tour. And I, I believe right now she's about 14 years of age. She'd be 14 now. And when we're sitting down to the parents talking about their goals and objectives, it was really interesting. They said, well, listen, we really want our, our daughter, you know, training like the Williams sisters and Sharapova and all these top tennis players. And we just sort of sat there for a second and the tennis coach said something that I'll never forget. He said, okay, well, how about this? How about we have your daughter train like the Williams sisters and Sharapova and, you know, all these great tennis players when they were 13? How about that? How about we take this 13-year-old great gifted tennis player and not so worry about so much about training them like, you know, the elite best of the best who are, you know, 25, 30 years old. But how about we train her like they were training when they were 13 years of age? How about that, guys? That really, really hit me hard. And, and what a great perspective. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, that's one of the things is everyone wants to get them to this very high level so quickly. And it's, there's some basic things that need to be worked on there. I mean, even just the joy of the game is a big part that, that people need to have. And I think, you know, we, we were listening to some other uh, podcasts earlier and, and, you know, you and I are talking about this is people get so caught up in the, the structure and the feel and all these different things. So what, what are the, what does the athlete want, you know, and how can we improve that athlete to be a better athlete, not just a, a better swinger kind of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, to be a better hitter. And if we are going to truly influence an athlete's or a player's ability to hit, we had better make sure that we attack, we attack, the, we attack the, the athlete first. Because if we're going to – our goal, like our goal in our programs, you guys, whether it's our pro guys or, or our MLB programs globally that are, you know, 15 to 19 years old, 
our goal and objective is to create the most well-rounded, robust, you might want to even say adaptable athletes possible. So when they get into the hands of the coaches, the coaches aren't limited or the limitations are, 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 aren't as great as they would be if the athlete wasn't as well-rounded. So if we can develop really well-rounded athletes, one, uh, they'll have more success uh, in terms of the skill set. But listen to me, maybe more importantly, we're, if we do it right and we pay attention to that first priority, rest, recovery, and sleep, we're seriously going to reduce risk of injury. Okay. And that's, that's all four of those. That's all four of those priorities, rest, recovery, sleep, nutrition, hydration, uh, posture, range of motion, and then teaching them to move properly. If we do this properly, we're going to significantly increase the coachability of our athletes. We're seriously going to reduce the risk of injury to any athlete. And most importantly, at the end of the day, no matter where an athlete winds up going in sport, we're going to have more people participating because the number one reason athletes do not reach their potential is injury. That's the number one reason athletes do not reach their potential. So it has to be on the minds of every single coach, every single athlete from grassroots all the way up to our pro guys. And if we could take that mindset, um, it's really easy to do, you know, just by modifying a practice plan slightly on a daily, weekly basis, you can significantly impact the athlete side you can have more success on the game side. It's more fun, more people playing. And the beautiful thing about this approach, especially if we incorporate it long-term from youth all the way up to pros, the spinoff of this is way more high performance athletes. If an athlete has the, the, the psychological wherewithal to want to chase down a high performance pathway in sport when they're 15, 16, 17 years of age, they're, they're going to be more likely to have the tools to have success. And that's really, really important. So, so Jeff, let me ask you this. And I know a little bit of your answer here, but, you know, we got, you know, people from older to younger kids to coaches and that adaptability and that changing uh, the demand is kind of a huge thing, even from a visual perspective. But let's say you take a college kid, um, you know, they don't have so much time and energy to put in. And I believe, I think coaches are afraid to go away from the structure that they have to do it this way. And, you know, with the research that you know about, you know, that leads to a lot of injuries. What are some ideas or thoughts to, to change it up so that they're, they're still getting something out of what they're doing without drilling too hard into someone to, to yeah. break them down? Yeah, yeah, no, and that's a tricky question, Ryan. That's a big scope question for sure. And it's one that's gonna, that has been and probably will plague us for quite some time because what, what do you do? Well, I think the best approach in, in, in when, we, when we consider that question, the best approach here has to be planning. We have to have a plan. And, you know, I'll just say this for everybody, for everybody on, it doesn't matter what sport you're involved in. Um, you can go to, and again, this is, again, for everybody, I'm Canadian up here and I've been involved with the Canadian sport um, 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 movement for quite some time. The Canadians have developed, this Canadian sports scientists at the national level have developed this thing called the Long-Term Athlete Development Plan. It's a model that originated here in Canada and is now spread all over the world. Um, the U.S., a lot of your sports has worked with our, our sporting organizations to adopt and develop their own. It's a long-term approach. And, and so what we need to understand is over the course of an athlete's lifetime, there are windows of opportunity for development. There are windows where cardiovascular performance has to be addressed, where skill and tactile type performance has to be addressed. There are times when strength needs to be addressed. Unfortunately, that's one of the biggest and most dangerous mistakes we make, addressing that way too soon. Um, but over the course of this big lifelong plan, we have to have strategic uh, um, plans inside of those windows. And that's where, that's where annual planning comes in. So for the coaches who are out there who are looking at, okay, how, how do we incorporate and make a more robust uh, maybe um, um, program or daily schedule or weekly schedule that can improve results? It's going to come down to your annual planning. What are you going to do early season? What are you going to do mid season? What are you going to do late in the season? And if you do get to the postseason, what do you do? It's the exact same approach we do with our big league guys. You know, we have an approach going into spring training. 
We have an approach over spring training. We've got an approach in the early part of the season. And what we did with our programs is we split the season into three parts, the first third, middle third, and last third. And each third had a different priority. And one of the things that we really, really worked to do, at least I did in my side of the programs anyway, and our coaches were fantastic as well, is we made it fun. So, so there's a bunch of things we could talk about here, Ryan, but fun is the number one reason athletes play. You know, Amanda Visick and her group at um, um, uh, university uh, did a fantastic study. And for every coach that's listening today, I need you guys at some point to Google Amanda Visick fun maps. I'll type it in here. Uh, Amanda Visick fun maps. And what they did is they looked at wh why do kids play sports? And it, this is one of the probably most powerful recent studies that really gave us insight out of the mouths of babes. They actually went out and interviewed a bunch of, of young athletes and they asked, hey, wh why do you play? And out of the 81 uh, sort of points that they sort of focused in on, the 81 fun factors that they got from all these athletes, where do you think winning fell in the uh, a hierarchy? Winning winning didn't even make the top yeah winning didn't make the top 10 winning didn't make the top 20 winning i believe was 48 on the 80 on the priorities for why athletes play sport winning that's, was that's going to be way different on, on parents or coaches yeah well no and that's yeah and and that and but this is where our systems fall apart though ryan right sometimes our priorities are not aligning with the true priority priorities of our athletes especially as we work through the age groups and you hit the nail on the head there man we've got to align what, what we've got to align the what we're trying to do with the priorities of the athletes but we also have to align like we talked about that college tennis player or that young tennis player we also have to align how we're training with the abilities and the, I call it the context of the athletes we're working with. And inside of any group, you might have subgroups because we know, especially even, even at the pro level, Ryan, you've seen it. There's yeah. guys who are up here, there's guys that are here, and there's some guys that are down here. They all have their strengths, they all have their areas of potential, but they're all very, very different. So even inside of your team, there could be subcategories you need to focus on, which is not an easy thing, especially for volunteer coaches out there. But if you can keep it fun, um, you're going to go a long, long way, and you're going to do a lot of good for your athletes. Yeah, I think that's something, Jeff, and, and you see it in, in every part of this uh, paradigm of the, of the athlete. But, you know, people ask me all the time, what's, what's the one thing I need to do for, for vision for my athlete? Well, you know, there's some baseline things we need that, that are important to get to another level. But everyone's needs are a little bit differently. And that's, that's the hard part is – you got to have that baseline knowledge, but then you got to be able to customize for each player to get themselves to that next level. Yeah, yeah, and that's where you really do need to communicate with the players. So you know, um, hey, m maybe just skipping a uh, skipping a note here, Ryan Warren. Uh, we've been doing some really really cool things with our athletes at every single level here during the shutdown. This shutdown um, is really really challenging for our young people, and uh, whether they're athletes or not musicians, our artists, the people, our kids who are in drama, you know, the kids who just are missing school and their friends, but certainly for our, ath our athletes, this, this downtime has been a really, really uh, um, kick in the pants for everybody. And, and for everybody that's out there, before we get to some of the questions, you know, we, what we've done is we've set up these shutdown strategies for our athletes. Are you okay? You want to, is it okay to talk now, yeah. Ryan? Go ahead. Yeah. So, cause I think this is really good context. So, so listen, we know that this is a frustrating time, but as soon as this happened, I was on the, uh, you know, for, for our athletes and our, our groups all over the world, I was on the internet. We were doing face calls, trying to frame this up, right? Because we knew everybody was frustrated. We have athletes that were about to sign college scholarships. We have athletes that were about to sign pro contracts in virtually every sport. And imagine the, the athletes that missed their provincials, the, the, the college guys who were in the last year of university missing the, the, the March Madness. It's devastating. The only thing we can do in a shutdown like this is the same approach that we, we use with our injured athletes. So for our injured athletes, we give them, we give them the 90 second rule. <laughs> it's, it's a little ruthless, I know, but we kind of have fun with it. We say, listen, if you get injured, you got 90 seconds. You got 90 seconds to be mad. You got 90 seconds to be sad. You can cry if you want. There's nothing wrong with that. You can swear and cuss as long as mom and dad aren't around. 
but you have 90 seconds to work it out. After 90 seconds, we're getting to work. We're going we're gonna to understand what the injury is. We're going to frame it up. We're going to understand what the injury is. We're going to understand the treatment. We're going to understand the return to play with the goal and objective that's over the time that you're not participating in your sport. When you come back, you're going to be better. And I'm going to tell you this, Ryan, you talked about this, I think at 3 a.m. in the morning in Vancouver at one of the conferences, one of the most valuable things we do with our injured athletes when they can't participate, when they're going through the initial phases of treatment and rehab, visual training visual training, understanding the context, understanding how to do it, understanding how to use it, such, such a valuable thing. And, and this shutdown is very similar, everybody. For your athletes, doesn't matter what age you're working with, we have to frame this shutdown as an opportunity to get better, simply put. So, so what we did is we came up with an action plan because what we found about you know seven, eight days into the shutdown, our athletes were all over the board. They didn't know what to do with themselves. So we quickly set, we quickly set that up, everybody. We had them, I, I hope you can see this, but we had them fill out a, a daily schedule, if you could see that. And it's just, this is, there's nothing fancy about this one, but it just was, hey, when are you waking up? When are you going to eat? Uh, when are you going to do your sports-specific training? When are you going to do your strength and conditioning? What days are you going to do cardio? When are you going to work on your vision? Um, if you're a student, when are you going to do your homework? Um, if, you're, if, you're, um, um, if you're a pro athlete, you know, when are you going to do your video work? Everything just sort of scheduled. So when they go to sleep at the night before, they kind of have an idea and some purpose the next day. This has been, for parents and coaches and teachers out there, this has probably been the most valuable thing we've, other than this video conferencing technology we have, which is incredible, this has probably been the most powerful thing we've done for our athletes. And we just talked to them about it. When are you going to have screen time, right? When are you going to bed? And, and, and when are you, oh, right here, when are you going to call your mom <laughs> or call your grandma if you're not living at home, right? All these things. This has been really, really important. And then we had them also fill out a self-evaluation, okay? Going into the shutdown, what were your strengths as an athlete? And what were your strengths as a player, regardless of your sport? And why were you good at that? And what do you need to work on to come out of the other side of this shutdown even better? This was probably the second biggest piece of our puzzle because it helped our athletes identify what they needed to do to get better. And here's something I'll share with you. We are terrible self-evaluators, absolutely terrible. And, and if I could share a little story here, I will. Um, I was working with an elite academy. And, and this is high school elite guys who've come across from all over the world to this elite academy. And I, I've been there about, I go there four times a year for about a week, a week at a time. And I was sitting there just watching them work with the coaches. And I noticed that a lot of the same things were being said. And a lot of the same things were being done, you know, throughout the year. And, and so without the coaches knowing, I, I took each, each athlete aside individually and I asked them, what are your strengths? Hey, what are you really good at in your game? And where do you think you have potential? Like, what, what, what could you work on to get better? And I did that to every athlete. I, the coaches, nobody else knew I was doing it. And then a the week, I said, hey, guys, I'd like to get the coaching staff together and just go through the roster so I can get a better understanding of how we might be able to help the guys. So, and again, you know, these are all great coaches, great experienced coaches um, who, who know what they're doing. So we sat down and looked at the roster of 21 players. Out of 21 players, and, and maybe we'll get the, everybody on the chat here. Out of 21 players, how many players do you think had the same self-evaluation as their coaches? Out of 21 players. Zero. Uh, three, yeah, it was one. Good, good answers, everybody. Yeah, and, 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 and great answers, you guys. Great answers. So, so what does that tell us? It's not that – one, it tells us we're terrible – self-evaluators and especially if you're a younger person right and you don't have the context and you haven't had those coaches now listen i've seen these coaches talk to the players about hey you're you know what they need to do uh but this th there was two things that were really prevalent here one we're terrible self-evaluators and two uh, as a coaching staff me included me included here this was an eye-opener for me as well this was years ago um we weren't clearly we weren't clearly communicating with our athletes where they might be able to get better.
Does that make sense? What a crazy thing, hey? Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's part of perception is we all perceive things differently. And, you know, even when it comes to from a vision standpoint, coaches or umpires or, or players or parents, we all think we see something a certain way and all four see it differently. And yeah. so communication, obviously, is what you're talking about. Writing this stuff down is a great, uh, you know, advancement to be able to help and understand how to help someone. Yeah, and if you guys have a good relationship with your athletes, like a good, open, honest relationship, I can say this proudly. We really, really work, Ryan. We really work to have an open book. If they have, if they have a personal problem, sometimes we're the first people they come to. We've just built that rapport, that trusting rapport with all of our athletes. If they have an issue, something they, they need somebody to talk to, they can. So when our athletes fill this out, we get a really good indication of where their minds are at, but also, you know, where they think they're at. And, and, and it goes much deeper than the performance thing. And, you know, sometimes it can be a confidence thing. Sometimes it might have no, the information here might have nothing to do with physical performance outcomes, it might have more to do with confidence or even state of mind as they're training and practicing and competing in sport. So again, between these two things right now during the shutdown, man, I'm telling you, this is, this is something I would, I've done it with my kids and they roll their eyes, of course, but it also, you know, when it comes to accountability, right? When it comes to accountability um, and expectations, you cannot have either of those. And I write about this in my book, as a matter of fact, the performance plan, I write about this um, because it's really important. It's one of the things we miss early on. If you want to hold an athlete accountable or yourself accountable, you had better set clear, concise expectations. And those expectations need to be based on really, really tangible effort type things. So, so this, this, does that make sense? Oh, definitely. You know, what, what you're talking about, Jeff, a lot is asking questions, you know, yeah, that's asking it. Questions. And, it opens and, the dialogue. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. This is awesome. You know, you know, you go back to uh, a little history of working with the uh, Toronto Blue Jays and we kind of talk about this because I worked with them at a different time period than you did. And um, it's amazing. Um, you know, they got a new high performance training center there now. And there's there's such advancements from when you started to when there is today for for all these athletes to be a part of how how do these athletes, you know, decide which way do I go? You know, there's just, there's so much stuff out there. Where do I go? Or coaches, there's so much information out there. What, what's first, what do I need to, to put my, you know, all my eggs in or a majority of my eggs in? Yeah. You know, I read a stat recently about how, how our knowledge is expanding exponentially now in this, in this knowledge age, you know, this information age. Um, and, and that therein lies part of the problem, Ryan, there are so many things that you need to do sometimes you lose sight of what you should be doing. And, and honestly, that's one of the reasons we went back to trying to identify those top priorities. Okay. So again, those top priorities for people who just joined us, sleep, rest, recovery, nutrition, hydration, posture, range of motion, and then movement. Those priorities need to be taken care of. There are so many new, shiny, exciting things that really do work, but they only work to a certain degree or they only work at all if, if the person is set up properly. And so what we really look to do is start from ground zero and then work our way forward. And then as the athlete passes through time, then all of these great resources that are now available can be plugged in. But let's be perfectly clear. They all have to serve a purpose. Okay. All these great tools in our toolbox now and all this great knowledge we have simply come down to a real equation okay what are we trying to accomplish okay and there was a there was a great graph it's a very simple graph and i i talk about this all the time and sometimes i get criticized about the simplicity of this but this is this graph right here is called the super compensation graph okay and that is sport performance at its finest if you guys look here right here this would be your fitness level or your performance level going into a practice or a training session or starting a year right here is when you start your work and the work that's done in this period right here is going to influence the change on the other side whether we're talking visual training whether we're talking strength training a skill the work that you do here is going to cause the outcome here and this model really helps athletes and a lot of coaches just keep the perception in check 
what are we trying to accomplish? How are we going to do it? What do we need to do? And then what tools are available? I mean, we have, we, we, we were lucky enough to be involved with Gifton Gope, who is the first African born, African born player to play in the big leagues. Yeah. If you were to see where he came from, as opposed to maybe somebody, you know, coming out of uh, one of the training facilities in the Southern States. It's like, it's like earth in the moon almost, but yet both of those athletes rise to play major league baseball. Okay. So what you do here has to be dependent on what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to get faster or trying to see the ball better? Are you trying to get stronger, more durable? Are you trying to recover, but whatever it might be, are you trying to throw harder? Are you trying to um, um, recover better? Whatever it is, this work here is going to determine your outcome. All right. And then the work you do is going to depend on the resources that you have. And so while there's so many things that could be done, I think we sometimes have to take a step back. And, and that's sometimes really hard when you're in the pit. Sometimes we have to take a step back and just try to understand what you're trying to accomplish here with the age group you're working with and with the athlete you're working with. You know, you know, way that I put it a little bit, you know, to add on is what's their task? What's the task of, Beautiful. of whatever it is? You know, what's the task of as a hitter? What's the task as a fielder? What's the task as a sprinter? What's the task, you know, simplify what, what it is to its simplest forms, not its goals, but what its task is. And when we can do that, then we're going to kind of figure out those building blocks that help us get to that task. And, you know, when it comes to baseball, you know, you look at some of the tasks, but, you know, you and I have both traveled around the country. Uh, we've been to, you know, Germany, to Canada, to uh, Cuba, to, I don't know, all, all different places across the world. And not everyone's got all these resources. And, you know, you bring up the uh, Gope, I can't even say his name. I remember him. Gift. Seeing them in, yes, the, in, yeah. in the minor leagues and the big leagues. And, um, you know, it, it's not – it's a dime a dozen. You're not going to get everyone in that, that country to do there. But they don't have all those resources. But they're very goal – task-oriented – well, I'm going to say this differently. They are goal-oriented, but they're task-oriented and simplifying their tasks to get to their goals. On there. Yeah, yeah, and that's right. And, 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 and let's be clear, nobody does it alone. I, I can't do it alone. You know, Ryan, you guys don't do it alone. It takes a collaboration. It takes a collaboration. And, and you know, at the root of this whole thing are the parents. I mean, and, and again, um, you know, when we, look, when, we look at, when we look at our pro guys, we've had this conversation um, many, many times. When we look at the pro athletes, they are special for a number of reasons. And I think the, the biggest thing that make, makes pro athletes and world-class athletes special was their tenacity, their ability to stick with it, um, through the boredom, through the monotony, through the pain and agony, through, through the years to reach a level where they're world-class. That alone is very, very special. Um, uh, and, and it's one of the reasons I respect every athlete I work with because I can't do it. When I was a kid, man, I couldn't wait for a baseball season to be over to start hockey. I couldn't wait for hockey to be over to start football. I couldn't wait for football to be over so we could play soccer. When soccer was over, it was back to baseball, and I couldn't wait for baseball again. But one thing I found out about me personally, just, you know, looking back in hindsight is I don't know if I ever had the, the stick to itness, you know, and now that I've had a chance to work through, through with, with, with Olympic athletes in figure skating, in, in tennis and badminton, and of course, all of our pro guys to, to see them go through the years and years of development that it takes to really, really harness and become world-class. Oh my goodness. It is so special. And, and along the way, uh, you really learn that it is a collaboration uh, between everybody and, and, and the performance team. The parents are incredibly important, uh, even, even with some of our pro guys. I don't know who watched the NFL draft last night. I thought the NFL did a fantastic job, everybody, uh, you know, taking us into their homes and seeing these guys when they're selected around their families. That was a true the, – the one thing that resonated with me last night what a team effort it was to get those young players into the first round. Oh my gosh, I had goosebumps all night. And, and that's, kind of, that's kind of what it takes. It's a collaboration. Nobody does it alone. And you need these people sharing ideas. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, it, it is a family deal. And, and there are a lot of people that there's, you know, there's no one coach that got that player to, to that place. It's, it's a collaboration of a lot of 
failure as well as successes that got, got any of those athletes to, to that next level. And yeah. even as you talk about that tenacity, I mean, that, that's what even SEAL teams, that's, that's what those guys, it's not always the strongest guy. It's not the uh, biggest guy, whatever it is. It's that guy who's, who can simplify it, task orient it, and have the tenacity to get through it. Yeah. And again, there's another great, great sharing of information, right? When we go to the Navy SEAL guys, the interesting thing about being with Toronto and being in pro sports is you get access to intermingle with these guys. And we actually were, we were playing in Baltimore. Every time we come to Baltimore, we had some people and, and high ranking officers from the military come to Baltimore, come from Washington to watch us play. And some of these guys were, were high ranking Navy SEAL officers. And, you know, you, you talk about my time and your time with the Blue Jays. I came in at an incredible time um, from the world of sports science for sure, but also where the organization was because we had uh, Clemens and Hankin going back to back Cy Youngs with all, if you go look at that roster, are you kidding me? Um, yeah. So that's where I actually entered sports. In the minor leagues, we had Chris Carpenter and Roy Halladay, Calvin Escobar, Cy Young, Cy Young, Cy Young, Cy Young, right? Yeah. And then along the way, we ran into David Wells and, and guys like Esteban Loiza, who won 21 games one year. All incredible. Anyway, Carlos Delgado and Sean Green. Those are two Yeah, really oh my gosh. Players. Well, we could go through the roster of all <laughs> these incredible guys. But, but the cool thing is to see how they operate, how differently they operated, right? They all operated differently, but they were all able to find a way within themselves to perform at the highest level possible day in and day out. And, and yeah. learn, learning, I learned as much, I could tell you right now, um, without question, I learned as much from those guys as I think they ever learned from me. Because, you know, we would collaborate. We would actually create drills that neither of us or any of us have ever seen before to get something done. We really were able to break down the problem because that's what it comes down to. If we could wish, if I could wish one thing on every athlete, the coaches today touch and uh, work with and all the young athletes, if I could wish one thing that we could pass on uh, to our athletes is, is teach them how to problem solve teach them how to break down a problem, understand a problem, and then work through the minutia of finding the answer. That will serve them in sport beyond anything you could probably coach, but it also will serve them in life because life is just a, a, a trail of problems we have to overcome and solve. And that's, I think, one of the powerful things in sport that we really lose. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie to you, Ryan, I, I had so much fun. Um, and and here's, a, here's a little story for you guys. One day, I was out with the guys, we were just having problems with alignment, you know, we're trying to, you know, work with some of the best pitchers in baseball. Uh, we were trying to make them better in, 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 this is early in the season. And we had a new coaching staff and a new manager. And I was out there just getting creative with the guys. And we started using the ankle tubing for some of our drills, just for, as a biofeedback system, not for strengthening, not for range of motion, but as a biofeedback system. Because what we found was the guys, you know, just talking about it, you know, we talk about, you know, the constraints led theory. We, and people are talking about all this stuff right now. And it's really important. We have everybody talking about it, but what a lot of coaches don't understand is we were doing that stuff in the fifties and sixties. We just called it something different. Yeah. So the constraints led, you know, theory of training is just creating an environment that actually, actually, you know, causes the response you want. And so what we were doing one day is we're trying to help the guys and just their alignment, their foot stride alignment with the pitchers. And we were just messing around on the bullpens before they're out there, just, you know, messing around. And they were just striding with the, with the uh, ankle tubing on and they found they couldn't cheat or when they did cheat, they knew about it right away. And so we were out there working and everything was happening. I had guys back in the weight room. So I took off back to the weight room and about 45 minutes before game time, the pitching coach comes in carrying my, the, the ankle straps and he goes, crusher, what the blankety blank blank is this? And I'm going, holy cow, man, I I'm in big trouble right now. I don't know what's going on. Cause he's all mad and stuff. I said, whoa, well, we were doing this. We we're doing this. We we're doing this is this is absolute genius. Where did you come up with this? I said, listen, man, we we're just, you know, the stuff we were talking about on video the other day, I was talking to the guys, we're trying to figure it out. And we, we all collectively just thought, he goes, this is, can he said, can I have these? I said, they're yours. <laughs> you know, Crush, here's the funniest part about that story. You, you brought up a lot of good points about being adaptable and making some changes on the fly. But I have almost a very similar story with the Blue Jays. I'm in there working uh, in the double A team and, uh, 
Got a player that um, not really tracking the ball really well. And we go in the cage uh, pregame, and we're working on some things about seeing the ball and, and really off a tee and, and how his eyes work. And the hitting coach at the time, I'm not going to tell you who this was, comes in and just sits there like this, just arms <laughs> crossed. And I'm thinking – I'm in trouble. I'm, I'm freaking dead. So yeah. I go back in. I have a good relationship with the manager. I go back in and I and tell the manager, hey, look, dude, I may have got some, someone in trouble. I don't know what the hell. Uh, here we go. And I hear this hitting coach just chew this hitter up and down, yell him, say, you got Helen Keller in here teaching you how to do something. Oh. And I'm like, God, I'm, I'm fired. I'm done. And everyone goes out to the field to start the game. And he, he all of a sudden comes in. I'm still in the coach's room. And he comes in. And I'm like, okay, here it goes. I'm going to get ripped. And he shake, puts his hand out and goes, I just want to thank you. I've been trying to get him to do that same thing for months. And whatever you told him through the eyes, got him to do what I needed to do. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was <laughs> so. Hallelujah, man. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Great story, man. Great. I'm sure we all have stories like that. But isn't so now that. I'm known as Helen Keller, teacher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no kidding. I love it, man. I love it. Oh, uh, that's great. You know, and it just goes back to that collaboration. So, so, Hey Ryan, just, 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 just before I forget, I'm just looking yeah. at some of the text here. Hey guys. So when we talk about going back to our conversation for the people who joined us late, um, one of our top, our fourth priority in performance was movement. And we asked the group where, where they thought movement started. And there were some really good ones here. Um, your core, it starts with your core. <laughs> starts in the brain, tendons, ligaments, bones. Well, when we look at, when we look at movement, here's how I would frame it up. And this is a conversation I have with every single athlete. And this is why everybody, we, we do our warm ups the way we do. We don't even call our warm up period. We don't call it an activation period. We don't call it a get ready period. We don't even call it a, a, a warm up period. We call it a movement, a movement stimulus period or a movement training period, because ultimately, in our warm up, in that whatever time you have, whatever age group you're using, you can totally influence the athlete performance of your, of your players. And it doesn't matter whether you have seven minutes or whether you have 20 to 30 to 40 minutes, you can have an impact every single day if you turn it into a movement program. And, and when we talk about movement with our athletes, we ask them where, because I ask every group of athletes I work with, where does movement happen? And we get all the same type of, type of answers. But when you really think about movement, and if you're going to create movement, think about swinging a bat or swinging a golf club. Think about kicking a soccer ball or running and catching a pass in football. If we think about where movement happens, all right, there's one, there's one, there's one common trait amongst every single sport that, that has to happen properly if you're going to be successful and, and get to a level where you can compete at the highest levels. And that is your interaction with the ground. If you, if you can understand and learn how to interact with the ground properly, you can launch your athletic career in a whole new level. And so when we talk about movement, well, the brain creates the – electrical impulses that tell our bodies to create movement. It passes the signal onto the muscles who contract to create the force that can create movement. The key to all of this, the tendons and ligaments transfer that force through the bones and to the bones. Okay. The, the, the nervous system communicates the electrical impulses. It all comes down to how you're interacting with the ground. If you're going to generate force, if you're going to generate movement in an optimum form, you have to have great interaction with the ground. And that's also different for everybody. One of the best pictures I have in sport, okay, is that at the All-Star game, I think 2017 at second base, where they have, where there's Altuve and there's Judge standing on second base, okay? And let's just leave the whole Astros thing out of this right now, but it's <laughs> One of the greatest pictures in sport, Altuve, who is what, 5'7", and then you got Judge, who's like 6'6", six, six, whatever, 6'7", six, or whatever he is, um, all playing this game at the same level. It is just, it's a powerful statement is what it is. But you have to understand, both of those guys, even though they have to, they have to execute very similar tasks, um, they operate totally differently. Um, so 
the one thing that will be consistent is how they interact with the ground. At the end of the day, they might be different, but if you can teach your athletes to interact with the ground properly, you can send them on a path. We know the, the best hitters have the most ground reaction force, the most powerful hitters. We know the guys who run fast have certain ground reaction force. And when we look at training performance in terms of movement and performance outcomes, that's really important. And when we talk about the lowest hanging fruit and everything that Ryan and the guys do there, um, again, the lowest hanging fruit is going to be, and, and because it's so untrained right now, is visual performance. Once you learn all of this stuff, once you have the body operating properly, once you're interacting with the ground, you're only going to be as good as the information getting to the brain. And that's where the visual side comes in. And that's why, Ryan, I was so, so fired up to talk today. Yeah, you know, and I appreciate you saying that. And, you know, the problem is from a vision standpoint, it's, it's just like everything. It's complex. It's not a simple thing. And I get a lot of questions and I'm looking at a couple of questions that were sent to me, you know, about timing and how do I, how do I best pick the ball up and how do I, um, where, where do my eyes need to be? What do colored balls have to do? And, you know, th there is you know, what I talk about is three segments of vision is the clarity, the skill, and the tactical part of it. And, you know, again, you got to have a great body to respond to some of this stuff. You got to be healthy, nutrition, all that stuff that we, that you're talking about. But once we, we get accurate visual stimuli to whatever the ball, the, the opponent, the um, whatever it is, now we can make that proper reaction. And like you said, every athlete's different and they move a little bit differently and they're, they're going to respond, but it all begins with the eyes of what they see. Yeah. yeah really, at every single sport. And here's an interesting thing, you know, and, and you and I, I remember had a great conversation one day about how different sports actually require different visual skills. That yeah. was a great conversation for me, Ryan, because I work with pro hockey players. I work with combat, the combative guys of boxers. I work with fencers and badminton players, football players. I work with golfers who have, you know, need to be very focused in, in baseball players who are, their vision has to be like this, as opposed to the, the athletes who need to be wide open. It's incredible. And, and for, all the, for all the athletes who are listening today and all the parents and coaches who are listening today, here's another really just important general concept when it comes to athlete performance and, and just human development in general is, you know, if, you, if everybody thinks back, for, for the older folks, the parents and coaches out there, think back to the kids you grew up with in, in junior high school and high school. And, and you know, I have a, had a group of friends. I was sort of a jock kid. So, you know, I had all my, my sport buddies, but I loved the science guys and, you know, the chess club guys. And, you know, we had, we had a couple of, of guys that I went to school with that went on to work for NASA as aeronautical engineers. I mean, that's the big leagues of science, right? I mean, boom. And, and, and about, about 10 years ago, I, I was just contemplating because we had sort of a, a school reunion. I was just contemplating. Isn't it funny how everybody sort of went on their different paths? And we got talking just about human development because people were asking me about my job. And, and here's kind of what we know. Um, and, and this is, again, a very important conversation in sport, the whole idea of specialization and early specialization. Listen, for everybody that's out there, um, our, our mantra, our mandate when it comes to multiple sports is play as many sports as long as you possibly can. All right? There are just – there's – such invaluable things that are developed when you cross over from sport to sport that work to create a, an entire holistic, really robust athlete at the end of the day. And by restricting experiences early on, and when I say early specialization, for me, um, I say before 12 years of age, some of the science says before 10, but I say specializing before the age of 12 in one sport is really, really risky business. And, and you know, we kind of use this stealing approach where if we specialize too early, you know, the, our, our young athletes might get an edge over the next few years, but in the long game, when they start getting into their late teens and into their early 20s, that ceiling, because of what we did in 9, 10, 11, 12 years of age, their ceiling of performance when they're in their 20s actually lowers down because of the lack of experiences. So even though they get a great spike in performance short term, long term, it's absolutely devastating. And the other side of that is we don't know where kids are going to really truly land uh, in terms of their psychology. And I got a great story for that. Just let me take a note here. I, I got a story I want to I want to share about that individual uh, in terms of their psychology, but also in terms of their physiology, right? We don't know. And vision 
has a huge part of this. We know that athletes who have great vision and athletic prowess, the ability to play, um, gravitate towards sports that, you know, sort of match their skill set. We know for a fact elite baseball players have better vision than the average person, right? That's just, that's a trait. People gravitate towards things they're good at, ladies and gentlemen. It goes back to that Amanda Visick uh, study. And so the more we can make sport enjoyable, tangible, and, and failure is not a, failure's not, not a problem. Failure is just part of the process. And if we can frame it upright, we're going to have more kids participating for life. But again, we're also going to have more kids participating in a high level of sport. And one of the keys to that is making sure they experience as many sports as possible because we don't know what they're going to be attracted to. And, and just a quick note, Ryan, if you're okay, just a quick note on that. I was lucky enough to work with some world-class squash players. And, and again, I am still on a mission to understand why squash is not an Olympic sport because I don't think there's a more physically demanding sport top to bottom than, than high-end squash. Um, but this young squash player I was working with, I got started working with him through his, 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 you know, 14, 15, 16 years of age. He was junior national champion and started getting onto the world stage. But he also played hockey and football and baseball. And he was really good at every one of these sports. And I asked him, I said, well, hey, Matt, what, 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 drew you to, what drew you to squash? I mean, it's a very individual sport. I said, as opposed to being in a team sport, because I know you loved hockey and baseball as well. And you know what he said to me, Ryan? He says, I don't like my fate being in the hands of other people. Hmm. He just, he, he, he loved the team sports. He loved the social aspect. He actually missed it quite a bit because we would have deep conversations, you know, because yeah. it's lonely over there sometimes. Uh, but he said he really liked having the responsibility of, of his own performance and his own outcomes. And, and that's more just a mentality thing. So, you know, if Matt had never experienced maybe – uh, a squash, maybe he would have got stuck in a team sport and maybe he wouldn't have had the success that he had because he was ranked on the world stage. Isn't that interesting? Hey, but, but you know, it's, it's funny, Jeff, you see those things are good at. Yeah. It's funny. You say that. I just was listening to someone talk a uh, golfer and I'm sorry, I don't remember the pro golfer's name, but he was a baseball player and uh, he was playing golf a little bit on the side. He said golf was the worst sport he, he was, was at, but he found a passion. He, he got a hole in one. He watched Tiger Woods win. And all of a sudden he had this drive and now he's a PGA player, you know, and, and, and so yeah, you're, you're right. you got to give that experience. Now, Jeff, um, you don't have any passion. I, w I wish you had a little bit more passion for what you do. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I feel the same way. And, and I don't think there's ever been a presentation where you have finished on time. Um, <laughs> if, if there has, it, it, it was a mistake. And I feel the same thing. I, I never have enough time. I always want to keep talking. And you and I could, uh, we've had these conversations, but we can go for about eight hours on, on these fascinating topics and how they relate to the athletes. But I think at, at the same time, you and I have a, a similarity is we, we're not necessarily doing this because we know we're going to get this guy to be the major league player or the professional athlete or the, or the, the gold, medal, gold medal winner. We have it because we want to get these players to another level that they're at at that time. And we're trying to give them little pieces of the pie that may not take them to another high level of sport, but it may take them a higher level in business or education or, or whatever it is. And, and that's why you and I attract to each other is that passion to get the human being to, to get the most out of them. And I think it's awesome. And I think I hopefully everyone felt that passion that you have on there. Um, the because of time's sake we had a lot of different questions in here and uh we don't need to answer them all but we can answer some of them but i want to thank everyone for joining us if they want to log off and, and stay on a little bit longer and ask some of these questions great uh, jeff's uh you know a great resource and uh we have his website we put on there crushperformance.com and like i said we didn't even get into his awesome refuel drink that is is phenomenal that you have to try if you ever get the opportunity and for, for us, you know, visit more at Slow the Game Down and also at, um, at NDB Performance. And then we have a new uh, education program at academy.ndbperformance.com. Follow us. Ask us any questions. We, both Jeff and I love to answer questions, whether it's different on social media or anything like that. We have some fun people coming up. As you've seen, we've had some fun people here. I've got, um, we got a great uh, ABCA Hall of Fame baseball coach coming on on Monday. We have uh, um, another uh, sports scientist from the Air Force Academy that does uh, sports vision at the Air Force Academy on Wednesday. 
I'm hoping that we're going to have a long range uh, rifle um, sniper uh, teacher. It's got a phenomenal story, not a military guy, but he now teaches some of the, 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 the guys in the military and more baseball people down the road. So keep joining us. I appreciate Jeff, but I know I can't ask this of you. The shortest answer you ever have, you have anything else you want to say to let to these people before we start answering more questions? Yeah, no, no, I think, I think it's good, but, but you, you're absolutely right. I think I'll just finish with this is um, it's about um, something we call player context. Where is the player at and how do we get them moving towards their goal? And, and that's, that's a process. And sometimes that means everybody taking steps backwards. Sometimes you legitimately have to go backwards in order to truly strive forwards. And that's part of the art of athlete and sport performance. And it's a beautiful, beautiful world to be in. So, so I'm glad everybody's here today. Awesome. Thank you guys. Um, Jeff, I'm going to ask a couple questions that I have here uh, from some people and uh, we can bounce them off back and forth to each other. And if anyone wants to, uh, raise their hand to ask a question or they want to type something in. We'll, we'll answer as many questions as we can. Uh, but one of the questions that is a combination is uh, how do you build confidence at the plate? And I'm going to ask these on a couple different questions that people ask. And at what age do boys generally start to want to dominate? Um, and yeah, pretty much those two can kind of be combined because, you know, confidence at the plate, and domination, whatever, it, 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 it is something everyone wants for their kid or for their athlete. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, again, you know what? Uh, confidence at the plate will come with success, right? So when, you know, an athlete is in a good process or in a good program and inside of a good process for where they're at, at their stage of development, and they start having success, go for it. And that's why, you know, you hear a lot of uh, – you hear a lot of sometimes criticism of pro athletes. Oh, they're all cocky and, you know, they're full of themselves. Damn right. It's because they've worked hard. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I have not met many elite athletes that aren't good people at the core, but they've just learned how to operate at a different level. So when does that confidence come around? When they start having success. When do boys want to start dominating? I think from the time they start walking. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, just to add on that confidence, I think you have to set them up for confidence as well as set them up for challenges too. But, you know, if, if they have confidence issues, they're afraid of the ball, uh, you know, first of all, they're, you know, from my standpoint, they're not really seeing the ball. They're thinking too much. They're scared of stuff and they're focused on the wrong spot. So getting them in a situation, whether it's a bigger ball, whether it's a softer ball, whether it's a different angle, different whatever, is create that confidence and that buildup uh, of getting in there. I, I have, uh, you know, we have m multiple stories, but, uh, we use a fun machine that Jeff, you've seen the uh, Robopong ping pong ball machine. Oh yeah, awesome. 160 balls a minute, and when we fire that thing, man, it's scary. And it's fire. Everyone gets scared. Big league guys to to young kids get scared. And what we do is we show them how when they control their focus, when they control their breathing, their balance, their their vision on the target, they can actually slow it down and react to it. And so, you know, we'll start at a slower level, but build them up. And, and I know the byproduct is that once they learn that, hey, I can slow something down, now when they get in the box, they know uh, if I'm in this zone, if I'm in this focal point, if I'm in this confident, confident stage, I can slow it down and get it, the ball to look big and I can get out of the way when I need to. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And you might know, me think of something, hey, coaches and parents and athletes out there, listen, we, we have a, a great conversation that we – make a point of having with all of our athletes and it revolves around the idea of just confidence and, and, and getting something done. And, and it kind of goes like this. Um, again, it goes back to our conversation about problem solving. If you want your athletes to have confidence, we cannot focus around outcomes. If you want your athletes to be successful at any stage, and I'm talking maybe even especially our pro guys, we cannot focus on outcomes. That, that is just, that is just something that happens. We don't control if we win and we don't really control the result of our, of our efforts either. What we do control is our going in. So if you want to build confidence, make sure you work on your approach. Work on the approach with your athletes so they're working with purpose. And then if they do fail, here's the deal. Problem solve. Teach them to problem solve. And this is the conversation we have. A problem accurately defined is already partially solved. And if you want to see confidence levels go through the roof, Get your athletes to clearly identify the problem. 
and then help them solve it. That, I'm telling you, might be one of the most powerful things at every stage of development. I, I think one challenge that is uh, the problem is sometimes not the real problem. <laughs> you know? uh, good point. So trying to right. find the problem is, is, is key. And sometimes, why did that elbow drop? Or why did um, you know, the stride get long? Or why did his arm do this? And you know, there may be something prior to that that maybe it's a confidence issue from the fact that, you know, maybe their girlfriend and them had a, him had a fight before they got to the field, you know, or maybe they just failed a test or maybe they were thinking about, oh no, someone's going to yell at me and they're focused in the wrong area. So making sure breaking that down to, you know, again, what I talk about is task oriented. What was the task? Where was the breakdown of that task, which yeah. led to other problems? Accurately defined. Love it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I wish I wish I could recall the conf the the quote that I, I got from someone else. It was something to the fact that there may be fifty problems, but if you go if you fix the wrong virus, you may never get there. So finding the right virus might fix forty of the problems. Right. Amen to that. Yeah. Yeah. And that again goes back to the conversation that nobody does it alone. You need that team approach and those different perspectives. Yeah. And and that goes to asking questions. Amen. You know, ask those questions. Thing. You may be wrong with assumptions. They may be wrong with their answers, but you start asking the questions and you start finding the solutions. Yeah, yeah, amen. You start down the path. Yeah. Now, uh, another kind of generic question that people ask in different forms, uh, but any exercise that help on on-field performance, uh, what are some of the warm-ups you can do? And this kind of goes into a little bit on the vision side. What's the best way to integrate vision training to practice or camp? Um, and there's a few others of those kind of questions. Um, so. Any thoughts on the exercises? Yeah. So, so again, uh, it all goes back. It kind of goes back to this graph, you guys. Uh, so those are big, big questions um, that could be maybe solved by endless answers. It all comes down to what are you trying to solve? What are you trying to accomplish? So for our warm-up, for example, we don't do static stretching in our warm-ups anymore. Not at all, ever. We don't static stretch prior to sport. What we found is it not only probably decreases sport performance if you stretch really aggressively static stretching like you know when, where you go down and hold it for 30 seconds not only have we found it can it can actually probably decrease sport performance it can actually increase risk of injury so you know like our warm-ups for example we take that period and we try to get the athletes in the mindset and get a good feel for creating movement with the ground forward running forward running with deceleration to backwards, lateral movements, change of direction. And then we challenge them with different movements every single day. And so in our warmups, we do a general warmup, which could be just be an easy jog for five, six minutes. And we usually get into a 10 yard grid and we'll do a sprint, 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 back pedal, shuffle, shuffle, karaoke. We change the sequence almost every time. Then we do a hip mobility um, um, work called ballistic walking. We'll do, uh, up, depending on the sport now, there's some sports, sports specificity as well. And then we go through getting geared up and we always finish with a game speed drill. Now, here's something very interesting about these warmups. And I guess, you know, one of the really early, uh, well-documented uh, programs was the FIFA 11 plus program. So FIFA, as a global orga sporting organization, set out to really challenge the status quo and have an impact on the injury rates in, in their sport. And they knew it had to be something to do with preparation. They spent millions and millions of dollars and this started way back in 2004, 2005. So what, what they did is they started looking at different approaches for getting athletes prepared for a sport. And you can go on their website and just, just punch out the 11 plus program, FIFA, I'll type it in here. FIFA 11 plus program. You can just Google that and have it check, check it out. It is just a simple, simple warm up. You're not going to believe it. But when you look, when you, you guys can Google this injury rates, when they looked at the teams that actually use this warm up consistently the most, they had a 50 to 70% lower injury rate than teams that didn't use it or only use it part time. So that just sort of resonated with everything we were doing because we were doing the movement oriented stuff way back in the early 90s with our guys in every sport. And so we use the pregame warm up to get ready to move and then teach movement to reinforce it. Uh, and we stretch and do our flexibility at the end of the day. What a great way to wrap up a practice. 
you know, circle the guys up. Everybody's warm. We get better results from our flexibility programs. We teach them breathing as well. And then we stretch at the end of the day. So, you know, when it comes to the warm ups, that, that's sort of our approach now. Now, incorporating vision into it, Ryan, you know, you, I lean on you guys for this because it is such an important tool. And sometimes, sometimes it's simple working with purpose, right? Yeah, you know, obviously, uh, you know, my, my whole thing is you can integrate vision into everything you're doing, whether it's just looking at targets, whether it's stretching the eyes at the same time, whether it's using tools. And even if you look over my, I guess I got to figure out how this works, but my other shoulder, I got those little targets on the wall and Warren's got some on, on his and we'll do a lot of dynamic movements while being able to see process and react at the same time. So integrating some kind of visual visual challenge at the same time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. And you know, um, Jeff, actually, there's, a, there's quite a few, I could probably go down about 50 of different ways of doing that. But um, you brought up something earlier. And it just it reminded me you brought it up again. Well, my dad uh, was working with the Kansas City Royals and the Royals Baseball Academy in 1971, two, three, in those era. They, um, and I forget the guy's name, I could probably think about it. But they were taking tire inner, inner tubes, tire inner tubes, and working on stretching with tire inner tubes back in the 70s. And how about that? Now we're paying 13 bucks for an elastic band. <laughs> I love it. But again, innovation, right? It it's is. funny how things kind of go in big cycles, giant cycles. Things that were things that always that work, so they fade away because of technology or whatever, but we always come back to them. We always come back to it. Isn't it crazy? It is. It is. It's it's cool. Um, and this you kind of answer this a little bit, but is it better the static stretch after practice or before bed? Yeah, well, I can tell you this. Some of our guys do like the feeling of static stretching. We just make sure it's separated from performance uh, with a window of at least 40 minutes, okay? And, and, and when we have our guys static stretch, you have to be warm. You have to be warm before you stretch. And we ask our guys not to hold the stretch longer than six seconds. So, for example, if everybody can see me, if I were to just bring my arm across, I would start the stretch right here, and I would pull it into full stretch over six seconds. So I'm warmed up, ready to go. It would be one, two, three, four, five, six to the end point. Great stretch. And then swing it out. So, so again, you know, guys do like the feeling of static stretching, and it can have an endorphin effect as well. But we try to get it when they're warmed up at least minimum 40 to 60 minutes. The closest window I would say would be 20 minutes, but it would have to be a light stretch. But if you're going to aggressively static stretch, give yourselves 40 minutes to recover before you start your performance work. Now at the end of practice, it's the ideal time. Everybody's warm. You're going to get the most out of that stretching regime anyway. And stretching is kind of like strength. So just think about this for a second. You know, we talk about problem solving, Think about flexibility. There's a reason we don't go and pound out strength work just before we, just before we go do our, our in-game performance, our practice, right? Because it would break us down and fatigue us. When we go to the weight room to develop strength, that strength is established, and that's what we're going to use to help execute our performance. Much like flexibility, once we've established a good range of motion around the joints, remember, that's our third priority, like a posture and range of motion. Once we've established that good flexibility, all we really need to do is maintain it over time. And you can do that by just stretching twice a week at the end of practice. So um, when we start looking at the science that's come around and what stretching actually does for you, there's a lot of great benefits for sure. But timing to performance is really important. You have to be warm. And doing it at the end of the practice is, is a really good strategy right now. Jeff, uh, Christopher uh, had a good question here earlier. To, uh, he asked, uh, do you prefer pre-practice uh, or game workouts or post-practice game workouts for baseball players? So oh, man, great, great question. Well, here's what I can tell you. When I started with the, with the Blue Jays, um, everybody was doing their workouts in the season after the games. And it kind of perplexed me a little bit because I'm going, okay, now we're going into the weight room at like 10, 30, 11 at night. We're trying to get a, some kind of decent work in. And then these guys are going to be all fired up. Endorphins are going to be flying. we got a cool down stretch. They're not going to be in bed till two o'clock. Here's what I tell you. <laughs> after, after the bars. After, well, then that's another discussion. <laughs> right? That's after another alcohol, discussion. Calms them down a little yeah. bit. Right. Hey, guys, here's what we know. Again, I, I, I can go, I've got to go back to this window. Okay? This little thing. And we, we should do a call on, about this right here, right now. This yeah. has been a 
really good tool. So this peak right here. So just to give you an example. So, you know, what we started doing with our guys for our bullpen guys who might kind of start warming up, getting into a game around 8.30, 9 at night. We had all of our bullpen guys start coming in at, at 12.30, 1 o'clock. And we would have everybody come in and do their work early. And what we found over time, it wasn't mandatory. I said, guys, let's just, it makes more sense. Let's get some good, short, concise, quality work in. And then once we're done the games, let's cool down and recover and get ready for the next day. So the amount of work we did, we made sure, didn't put them in a hole where they couldn't perform at night. As a matter of fact, the work we did was so strategic that it actually caused them to be at a higher level of readiness when game time came around. Here's what we know about exercise, okay, and mood state, biochemistry. And doing, doing the right type of work prior to competition totally heightens performance, 100%. doesn't matter whether it's strength work, your speed work, your movement work, even your performance work. And that's where putting everything together in a master plan is so important. We have all of our guys, if we have the schedule, we have every one of our guys work out before the games. Now, if we have a day game, all right, we get the guys in early, early, we get them in a movement pattern, get them fired up. And then in a day game, say one o'clock, we'll work out at the end of the day because, you know, we have the time frame. But if your schedule is night games, well, all, all I can tell you from our experience, working out before is so, so valuable. Yeah, Jeff, I, I'm going to wrap this up here because, like I said, I know you go forever, but that's the same thing with the eyes too. You know, yes. we, um, if, if it creates a – if they have some stress, we may do after game, but we want to get their eyes warmed up and ready to go. So they, they do the exercises – right before or hours before on there. And I think it, it leads to another key thing, kind of last point that I want to add to this is, is sleep. And, you know, someone asked in here about how much sleep they, they should have. And obviously with the strength programs, the, the say vision programs, mental programs, hitting programs, uh, you know, whatever yeah. else is going on, it's hard sometimes for these guys to get sleep, but as briefly as you can, as briefly, as you can, Jeff. Dangerous. Yeah. Very dangerous. That's another five hours. But yeah, it is. We can, we can literally do a call. We can literally have spent this entire time talking about sleep, the benefits of sleep. And yeah, and I think maybe we'll have you back and do it. Well, and I'd love to. I would love to because, again, it's our number one priority. Here's what we know, okay? Different age groups, different demands require different sleep, okay? So sleep is our number one priority. When we, when we organize our athletes' daily schedule, the first thing we log in is the amount of sleep they're going to dedicate over a 24 hour period. So, you know, for our teenagers, we're looking anywhere from eight to nine hours of sleep. We like to say 10 for our elite athletes. We like to recommend 10 hours of sleep. We know at 10 hours of sleep, even if they're not sleeping that whole time, we give them breathing exercises, meditation exercises. They're going to be really recovered for the next day. One to reduce risk of injuries. Sleep reduces risk of injuries it increases plasticity and brain development for sure. It also will help, help us um, um, perform at a higher level without question. Um, when it comes to sleep in general, we know it's hard. There's things that come up. So this is what we do to take the stress off our athletes. We block our sleep, everybody. This is a very important uh, concept. We block our sleep. So we know we need eight hours of sleep per night. Over the course of seven days, our athletes need 56 hours of sleep. So for some reason, if they don't get to bed on time or if they wake up early or whatever might happen, it's no point to be stressed. It's not a stressful point. We make that sleep up either the next day or we nap. Naps for everybody. Naps are supposed to happen between 2 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon, ideally. Okay, in an ideal schedule, we don't want it so late that it, it interrupts our night sleep. And we don't want it so early that it makes us drowsy or doesn't impact us in our performance time. That is, seems to be the optimum time for sleep between two and four in the afternoon, no more than 15, 20 minutes. Some science is saying up to 90 minutes, but 90 minutes, that's getting into sleeping, not those quick power naps. So again, that, that's sort of our parameters for sleep. And again, we could talk about the power of the sleep extension studies, the age-related sleep, but it's all out there if you guys just uh, look into it. Or if you have questions, email me. I'll get it to you. Yeah, I think, Jeff, uh, it's awesome. I think we should look at doing a little episode because, you know, even from the vision side and how that sleep affects vision, and even uh, this is a bigger topic, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang it out there, is how screen time uh, affects the eyes, which affects sleep and, and 
everything that's needed. So I think that's a whole nother five hours that you and I will discuss at another time. Otherwise, again, people will not get off their computers now. So yeah, guys, time. Hey, I appreciate it. Like, you know, you guys all joining in here and I uh, hope you guys join us again later. And thanks Jeff again for your time and, and uh, have a good rest of the day. Love it. Thanks for having me guys.